Hello everyone and welcome back to Strategy Gaming Dojo where we find, learn, and play the great strategy games. We are currently making a basic tutorial for one of the greats, Gary Grigsby's War in the Pacific Admirals Edition. This is going to be episode number six. This one I think I'm going to entitle Task Forces. I think what we'll do is go down to Sydney Sydney, Australia, that is, and make a bunch of task forces of different ship types um, so you can see how task forces are made, what we're thinking about when we make task forces, uh, how they kind of come together and operate, and the fuel uh, situation that you're thinking about when you make a task force. So I think Sydney is a good kind of representative example of the different kinds of task forces that you'll be making in this game to send around the map to do various things. So we're going to go down and do that. Uh, before we do that, we have a task force selected right now. So as usual, when the turn starts, we are centered at Pearl Harbor. Now you may notice that we've got fewer circles than we normally do here. I have turned the aircraft uh, radius circles off. So this is just ship or task force, I should say, task force radius circles that are up here. To give you an idea, and we'll do this all throughout this episode, and just we're just going to be focusing on task forces. Now. You may say, so, you know, what is this? So if you, we look down here at the heads up display, you see um, highlighted here, you see the air wing, this fighter group. Well, we have those radiuses turned off, so we're not seeing how far out the fighter group can go. Uh, the ground units we never see, they don't have radius circles. So what we're seeing is this task force's, you know, radius circles is what they're called. And what are these? So the green line is at mission or cruise speed. The, the extent to which this task force will move in a 12 hour pulse. So as I've mentioned several times, every day is made up of two pulses. You have a, a night pulse first and then a day pulse. This shows you exactly how many hexes this task force can move in one pulse. And if you double that, now you may say, oh, well, that's what that yellow line is, then is the doubling. Actually, it's not. The yellow line is if you had it at max speed, how fast it could move uh, in 12 hours. So if you're, if you're, you know, looking at this out here, every one of these is 40 nautical miles. I mean, this thing's gonna, this task force could move 360 and almost 400 nautical miles in a 12-hour period. That's amazing. I mean, that's moving very fast, right? So what is this? Well, you can probably tell by the icon uh, that this is a carrier task force. Uh, sure enough, it is. And we look at the speeds. So as you can tell, every hour we're almost moving a hex. So if, uh, you know, a hex is 40 nautical miles, the speeds here... Uh, are fantastic and you'll be wanting to think about these speeds because this task force will move at whatever speed the slowest component of the task force is so if we just randomly had thrown a cargo ship in here that moves at 12 this entire task force will move at 12 <laughs> so you don't you don't want to be uh throwing slow ships in with fast ones because you slow them all down. Um, and that's why we're a little particular, even in the cargo uh, task forces, that we're going to be trying to stick like, like statistical ships together. So if we have a group of ships that all move at 12, not, or 12 nautical miles per hour, we're gonna wanna keep them together, assuming they have the endurance um, and the cargo load to make it have it make sense. But to the extent, I, everything else being equal, you want ships with the same speeds traveling together because a slow ship will slow everyone down. So I brought this up just because, you know, hey, the aircraft carriers are the coolest uh, ships in the game, right? So I just wanted to bring up this carrier task force. Now this is currently um, at Pearl Harbor. It's just sitting sitting there. 
Obviously, uh, Pearl Harbor, the attack on Pearl Harbor happened yesterday. Uh, the Enterprise was spared. It was not hit. Um, many of its uh, support craft that will be around it. So this, these are cruisers. CA stands for cruiser. CV is a carrier. CA cruiser. DD, those are destroyers. Um, and this is a fairly typical setup for a carrier group. So a carrier task force, you're going to have the main carrier. You usually want to separate the carriers into their own task forces, even if they're in the same hex. Maybe you want to keep them in the same hex for some reason, but you don't want them in the same task force. That goes to, you know, as the Japanese torpedo bombers come in and try to attack them, you really don't want them right next to each other. So, you know, if they're in separate task forces, even if they're within 40 nautical miles of each other, they're not right on top of each other to where if you got caught by surprise or something else, you could lose two aircraft carriers, which would be complete and total disaster. So you've got the Enterprise. This hash means that it is the flagship of this group. Uh, these three cruisers are along with it. Often you will have cruisers with your carriers, and I'll show you why. When you bring up, and we'll go through ships, I think in the next episode, individual ships, but I want to show you over here. This is, these are the stats for this cruiser. You've got the max speed 32, which means it can move up to nine hexes every 12 hours, which makes sense, right? If a hex is 40 miles, this is moving 32, you know, in 12 hours, it can move approximately nine, almost 10. Uh, you see the cruise speed. So in, in this case, that can only move four. And so let's back out of here as usual. Let's back out. So if it was going max speed, it could go uh, almost nine. And this is for the task force. But, you know, if that ship I just showed you was the slowest one, that's how fast it would move. So this is all the way out here. Now we're hardly ever going to be in max speed. So this is the uh, cruise or mission speed for this task force. It's going to move about this far every 12 hours. So if we ran one turn and we gave it, uh, let's say we gave it orders to go all the way back to San Francisco or LA, it would do this in the first 12 hours. It would do this in the second 12 hours. Although I don't want you to think that this yellow line is the full day move it just so happens that that's it's the same this time this is really showing you what it can do in 12 hours under your different modes so anyway let's go back to this uh as usual i had a thought then i had another thought uh so let's go to the northampton so you see the northampton uh you know it's kind of got its you know what it's assigned to Pacific Fleet. It's got its captain. We'll go into captains. To be honest with you, I don't pay that much attention to captains. It's not something... Look, if you want to go down that rabbit hole and really think about the captain that you want on every ship on this this game, you feel free. I, there are some people that really enjoy that part of the game. That's not really for me. Uh, you just want to make sure that if it's a good ship, especially like an aircraft carrier. Now, this is a cruiser, but for an aircraft carrier, you want this guy to be over 50 at least, uh, probably up into the 70s and 80s for an aircraft carrier. Um, it does make a difference, you know, who these captains are. Um, it's just some rabbit hole that I don't go down necessarily and I think you can play the game without focusing on it you may just want to glance at it um, let's just say you did want to change out this guy you click here here are other guys that you could change it to so you know he's 56 63 uh, you know there are a lot of there are a lot of captains here let's just look at leadership what's what's our big guys here Ehrlich 62 63 so i think our, our guy was 56 60 he's plenty fine enough to be in a crew you know to be uh commanding a heavy cruiser so uh that's leadership inspiration uh you'll also see crew experience day and night um the u.s this is the only thing i'll say about this 
the U.S., especially early in the war, is a light years better during the day than they are at night. They will get better during the night um, as they get radar. As the ships get radar, more and more of them, they're better at night fighting at the start of the game. You don't ever want to challenge the Japanese at night. The Japanese are just a lot better than you at night. So looking down the ship, you can see all of its armaments here. You know, a lot of times you just kind of want to look at the big guns. The 8-inchers, uh, hey, that's pretty good, you know, for a cruiser. It's it's not fantastic by any means. We'll look at battleships with 16-inch guns. They can do a heck of a lot more damage. But, I mean, you know, think about the uh, depth of this game. I mean, you're looking at, you've got six 8-inch guns, um, they're facing the front. You have three in the rear. Uh, they're mounted three and three, so there's two mounts in the front, evidently. It shows their armor, how much range they have. So, I mean, 31,000. Uh, that's feet, I would imagine. Uh, it, it is, I say, I imagine. Um, 31,000, that's good range. Uh, penetration, how much ammo. I, I mean, this thing goes down to... The, literally down to the ammo shells. You do not have to get that deep to understand and enjoy the game. What you really want to look at uh, over here, besides all, all of this stuff, um, is the anti-aircraft. So the two main things I look at on a ship after we get past, you know, the speed, which is, you know, obviously very important, and the endurance... Um, the, the main things I look at on a capital ship like this, especially one that's, I don't want to call it a support ship because that's kind of its own thing, but it's, um, it's in a carrier task force. It's not the main ship in this task force. Um, what I'm going to be looking at for this is anti-aircraft 282 and anti-submarine none. So this 282 is actually very good. Um, Let's just back up for a second and look at a destroyer. A destroyer has only 130 anti-aircraft uh, and two anti-submarine. Um, so going back to Northampton here, 282 is very good. There's not a good scale that I can give you that says, hey, this is great anti-aircraft and this is bad anti-aircraft. Um, other than to say less than let's say 100 is not very good and over 100 is fantastic um, you can see this aircraft carrier enterprise anti-aircraft is 500 500 is excellent it's a lot of anti-aircraft so two 200 for the Northampton 282 very good uh, let's see what the Chester has it also has 282. They're both part of the Northampton class, so they're the same build of ship. Uh, is Salt Lake City the same? No. Now, this is the Pensacola class of, of cruisers. You don't really have to worry about that so much, other than it's... Now, look at this. So, the anti-aircraft on the Pensacola class, 416. So, you're talking, you know, 1 and 1 1.6 times, I guess, what you've got in the Northampton class. This is great, right? Because the more anti-aircraft we have, the better these ships are going to be protecting our aircraft carrier. And that's really why they're important to be in here. So you put the cruisers in with the CV, with the aircraft carrier, to give you anti-aircraft. That's, that's really what you're looking for in the force selection when we um, do force selection. So the mission for this is air combat. When we pick air combat and it shows you all the ships that can be in an air combat task force, it will show you the AA values. That's why you want cruisers or light cruisers along with your aircraft carriers. Now, why do we have all of these destroyers? So destroyers are incredibly important in this game because they are the main ships that are going to be doing anti-submarine warfare so that's why we have all of these destroyers here they're going to be out on you know on the periphery of this task force if we kind of 
think about the, you know, there's an abstraction here, of course, but when you think about the task force and the numbers and the algorithm the game runs, think of these destroyers being out on the perimeter, making sure no subs can either get in here to the cruisers or, most importantly, get anywhere near uh, your carriers. So let's pull these up. DD, we've got a destroyer. Again, you go down here, much better at day than night. You've got your captain, blah, 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 blah. Now this, I actually don't know a ton about World War II armaments. So when you look at all this and you're like, gosh, I'll never figure all this out. Again, it's not that important. Uh, it is, but it isn't, right? What we're really looking at is the are these numbers. So the anti-aircraft, uh, pretty good. You know, 130 for a smaller ship, not bad. You know, it's not 416 like that Pensacola class cruiser we just saw. Um, but, you know, it, it adds to the air defense. But the most important thing with destroyers is you see this anti-submarine too. And you're like, well, that's not very much, you know, when it's got a 130 anti-aircraft. Really anti-aircraft, maybe the best way to think about that is think about that on like a one to 1000 scale where anti-submarine, uh, anti uh, ASW, as I'll call it going forward, is on a 1 to 10 scale. So this is giving you a 2. I will tell you, early in the game, it's you, you try to take every bit of anti-submarine you can get. There's not enough of it. Uh, the Japanese can kind of have their way with you a bit early in the war with their submarines because, you know, 2 is not great. It's also not 0. So you take what you can get with anti-submarine early in the game. I will tell you 15 to 20 days down the road, we get a huge uh, basket of destroyers that show up down in the Panama Canal. Essentially, the U.S. just took them from the East Coast and put them over in the Pacific. So they show up at Balboa at the Panama Canal, and those destroyers have uh, radar. So as I said, I don't worry a whole lot about the individual armaments. I don't get into, you know, is this five-inch five uh, gun going to be able to do X or Y? It's just too much, you know, it's too much to handle in this game to think about every little part like that unless you're super interested in it. Um, but I will tell you, the one thing that you really want to look at in ships is the radar. Uh, you're going to have surface radar and you're going to have uh, air radar. So we'll get to that when we see one of those. I think there, I think there's some British destroyers out on the board and I'll try to find them that already have radar installed and you'll see that their ASW will be like eight or it may be four. We have some things that are fours, but the ones with radar are eight and those are super, super valuable because early on as the allies, what you're really trying to do is not lose as much as you can <laughs> you know you're going to lose stuff the japanese are going to knock out convoys they're going to blast away at some of our air force um but you really want to try to not take silly risks with a bunch of stuff uh we do get a bunch of cargo ships we get a bunch of uh troop transports eventually but there's no reason to waste those and so the more anti-sub stuff that we can do the better i always try to send anti-sub with uh you know important uh fuel so big tankers they're worth quite a bit in this game whoops um i try to send uh anti-sub with them uh but definitely with a carrier so we're still on our carrier here definitely with aircraft carriers you want destroyers uh as many as you can get around i say as many you know this is a good number this is like seven or eight uh let's see if we have any other different classes here so we have the gridley class um this has got a different endurance which tells you it's probably got a, it's a different class benham class um oh i was gonna say it's got depth charges so that's what is gonna be uh blowing up the subs if it can locate the sub again this has got two anti-submarine out of 10 not great but if it locates it it's gonna start uh, dropping these depth charges and we'll see all of that in the combat animations um how about the dunlap what's what do we got here 
this is the fanning class. And again, if you're interested, you can look at this, research the fanning class, uh, and so on. But I really look at anti-aircraft, anti-submarine. That's what's important to me anyway for these, I'll call them auxiliary ships um, in an aircraft carrier task force. Um, so I think this is good. This is sitting at Pearl Harbor. Again, the Japanese main attack force is right up in here. We do not have any recon on them. So we don't know exactly where they are, or where they're headed. I can tell you that they've spent most of their ammunition. Uh, they're a little low on fuel. So they're not going to be hanging around Pearl Harbor here for long. They're going to be skedaddling back here this way. That being said, here's another, you know, while we're looking at task forces, what's this lonely little ship? Now I will stop here for a second to say, I know a lot of people that have started this game and said, I mean, I can't even see these things on the map. What's good, you know, look at this little guy or look at this little guy. And that's an aircraft carrier task force. Um, you get used to it <laughs> is the best way I can put it. I actually really, really like the map in this game now because to me, having like a big old, you know, unit hex out here, uh, I don't need that anymore. I'm used to work, looking at the map and seeing these things right away. And you can tell this is an aircraft carrier task force because you see the flat top. So the main ship in your task force is going to, going to be the map representation. I'm not sure if I talked about that in part two. Uh, if I did not, that's how it works. So we've got another carrier task force out here. We have three carriers at the start of the game. So this is the Lexington. Uh, I think we have the Enterprise, the Yorktown, and this is a good chance. We'll go up here and look at our uh, task forces. Uh, mission, air combat. Well, gosh, I think this is, that was a bad way to do this. Let's do all active ships, and we can see our carriers right here. CV, CV, CV. We have a light carrier that's actually British. Um, that's all the way over... Um, near Ceylon, near Colombo. Uh, it's in Tr Trincomalee right now. We may go look at it at some point. British carriers are a little different. For whatever reason, the British didn't really believe in fighter aircraft on their carriers. So they have a lot of dive bombers. Um, now we'll eventually try to load you know, some fighters on there to protect it and get fighters up in the air. Uh, if you think about carrier war, the way it works is, is, you know, you have your fighters up that are running cap over all of your ships. Um, you may even have some fighters that are running escort with your bombers trying to hit the, the enemy carrier. The enemy carriers are going to have the same. They're going to have fighters up protecting their, their ships, but then they have some escorting and they've got bombers coming your way. Um, so it's just odd that the British really just said, you know, with fighters, whatever, we're just going to launch dive bombers off these things um, at the start of the war. So I, I went down a rabbit hole there. Hermes is the one British carrier. Now it's a light carrier, not a, not a distinction really per se, other than it doesn't have as much endurance. It's not as big. It's not as fast. That's why it's a light carrier. But here are our three car carriers. We've got the Lexington, Saratoga, and Enterprise. The Saratoga is back at San Diego. Um, so if we look here at San Diego, it actually has not even been put into a task force yet. Now, nicely, we have you know some destroyers here. We have a light uh, cruiser here that we can put into a task force with Saratoga, but it is just sitting here at San Diego. Uh, likewise, uh, so that was San Diego, that's Saratoga. Uh, the Lexington, whoops, you don't click on the name, you go to the location. That's what we were just looking at is the uh, Lexington here. 
and let's get out of that screen and actually go look at the Lexington Task Force. Again, you see um, the carrier, it's the flagship. So, you know, it's air combat. You've got the three cruisers here. This only has five destroyers. Now, the reason I wanted to show you this is this thing is hightailing it back to Pearl Harbor. That's a terrible idea because, as I said, the Kitty Butai, which is the Japanese attack force, that's what they called it, is right out here somewhere. We just can't see it yet. This task force, the very first thing I do <laughs> in this game is set a whole different destination. So that's what we're going to do. So let me click off that, which is just right click. If you ever left click on something in this game, if you right click, right click just kind of clears everything. Um, so we're going to say, oh, wait a minute. We do not want to be heading back into the teeth of that Japanese force. We're going to hit set destination hex. And we're going to try to get down here uh, as far south as we can, as fast as we can. And now you can see it changed the routing, right? Um, and so with the speed of this task force, 33, 32, so our slowest ships are the cruisers at 32. We're going to be moving almost one hex. Um, yeah, so we're going to be moving at 32. Every 12 hours, we're going to get here at mission speed. Um, is that true? Hold on. Let's pull this up. So we've got, yeah, cruise speed is 15. It's showing max speed for some reason. Um, these are your max speeds, but the cruise speed is going to be 15, which means, and this shows you this here, the maximum we can move every 12 hours is four hexes. You know, one, two, three, four. It's actually just a little bit more than four hexes, uh, but we're going to be going at full speed. So we're going to take off mission speed, cruise speed. We're going to full speed. So now where we told this to go, um, again, what do all these numbers mean? We went into this a little bit last time. The home port of this uh, task force is Pearl Harbor. By going to full speed, we only have enough fuel to go 51 hexes. That's what the left number is. If this followed orders and moved all the way here, stopped, and then went all the way back to its home base, Pearl Harbor, which it will do after it follows its orders. So its orders right now are to go to hex 158, 146, and then turn around and go to, port, go to home port because we haven't told it to remain on station. We haven't told it to do anything. Its only orders were to go to this hex, and then it says, oh, okay, I'm at this hex. Now what? Uh, it hasn't told, the player hasn't told me to do anything else. Let's go back to Pearl Harbor. That, if it did those two things, down and then to Pearl Harbor, that would be 81 hexes. We only have enough fuel for 51 hexes. That's why that's in red. It's telling you, you don't have enough fuel to do the round trip. Now, it's allowing you to give the order. Why is that? Because of this 39 in parentheses, which is telling us from here to here is 39 hexes. So that is allowable. But then we're going to be in a real quandary when it comes to fuel once we get down here. We've got some small islands. Eventually, Christmas Island will be big enough to support um, a task force. I, we couldn't dock. Let's see what the... Yeah, I mean, it's a smaller port, Christmas. You could never dock, but you could have auxiliary ships sitting here, oil tankers, that could you know, fill up your task force, your uh, carrier task force. And we will have that eventually in the game. Palmyra is another smaller port that we do use but they're never they're not even close to being big enough uh pago pago eventually will be big enough we've got this as a two and two now uh port capacity we will eventually take that to a five and two because pago is one of those daisy chain islands um <coughs> excuse me i just wanted to show you some kind of cool you know hey here's an aircraft carrier 
this is, hey, where did my aircraft carrier go? Uh, if you ever have this problem again in the game, you can just search uh, for your aircraft carriers up here in the databases. There it is. And it's now showing us max speed. This is how far we're going to be moving to right here every 12 hours. So you can see in one turn, we're going to be way down here, which is great. We want to get as far away from the Japanese as we can. Now, I can tell you how I usually play this. I head it south. I don't go all the way here. Um, I'll, I'll stop here. We'll kind of do a U-turn, and then we'll, we'll skulk back to Pearl Harbor and get it here at Pearl Harbor, get our two uh, aircraft carriers there together to kind of protect against the, you know, a potential that the Japanese could, you know, throw another raid this way or just protecting Pearl Harbor in general. So there, we went through a couple of uh, carrier task forces. I just wanted to do that at the top because I think they're kind of cool. If you're playing this game, you probably want to mess around with aircraft carriers. They're a lot of fun. I can tell you in uh, the aircraft uh, section, we'll be doing a whole section on carrier-based aircraft. But if you click on the Lexington here, here are its air wings. These are the aircraft that are actually on the ship. And so VF-2, you see you've got your Buffalo Fighters, um, 17 of them that will launch uh, and will give these orders. You know, we'll put them up, uh, cap patrol, we'll have them escorting bombers, but we'll get into that when we get into planes. Okay, so we've done that. That was the uh, that was a lot of fun, and we're gonna. But in this episode, we're gonna go down here to Sydney, and we're going to put together a, a normal complement of task forces that you would put together in the first turn of the game out of Sydney. So we see Sydney's a great uh, place to do this. It's got 57 ships in port that are not in task forces right now um, so we have a ton of ships here that all need different kinds of orders now i gave this shout out i think last episode to a guy named cull who has put together uh the initial turn one for the allies for every unit in the game and i i think i mentioned last time you know i know some people are resistant to look at that spreadsheet because they say uh, you know, that's cheating to some degree, or I want to figure this out myself. Believe me, in this game, you have plenty of more turns and plenty of more time to make your own mistakes. <laughs> so, you know, putting together these task forces in turn one and getting them right uh, can be a great learning experience for learning the game because it really shows you why you're doing certain things. And if, if you follow Cole and you follow his spreadsheet that I'll link to again under this episode, you're going to say, aha. You're going to have a lot of aha moments where you're like, oh, that's how this works. And if you take your time and move down through that, by the time you get to the end of the spreadsheet, which, you know, there's over 4,000 things you go through, um, you're going to really have a deeper, richer understanding of the game. That doesn't mean you can't go through and do it yourself. And I know some people that do that, or I know a lot of people that do that, and even say, hey, with the first turn, it's not that important. As time goes on, I'll set up these you know, cargo task forces in turn two, in turn three. One turn, one day is not going to matter uh, for the whole length and breadth of World War II. So, you know, hey, do it how you want to do it, or if there's like a certain place that gives you trouble, you could look at that spreadsheet and say, oh, okay, it makes sense to me why I'm going to be putting these ships together or what, uh, what not. So here we are out here in beautiful Sydney, a place that I would definitely like to visit someday. I've never been to Australia. I uh, can't wait. Every Australian person I've ever met's cool as heck. Um, a lot of fun to hang out with. And I like Australian rules football. If you've never seen it, check it out on YouTube sometime. It's a crazy game. So anyway, we are going to be setting up task forces out of Sydney. Sydney has all of these ships in port. Um, Sydney does have a task force set up, which we knew, of course, because we've watched the earlier episodes of the tutorial. 
It's got a ship here. So it's set up uh, one task force, at least one, right? And it's this one here. We're going to look at it really quickly. It's the cruiser Canberra, which is the flagship. It's a surface combat, which means it's two, you know, uh, larger combat ships. The Canberra, which is a cruiser, the light cruiser Perth. We are actually not going to do anything with them this time. Now, we will be moving them. Uh, if we're following that cull spreadsheet that I have talked about, about the optimal first turns, um, we will be moving them up to Bowen. And we're going to have them remain on station at Bowen with a home port at Townsville. Uh, the reason being is with these capital ships early in the game, you want to use their anti-aircraft. So the Canberra has 348. That's very good early in the game. Um, you know, as I said, that really kind of runs on a 1 to 700 scale, sort of, at the start. Uh, but 348 is pretty good. We're going to want to use their anti-aircraft as if they were sort of anti-aircraft guns that we had in town. So that would be protecting from the Japanese coming down this way. Uh, we will use those guns. But for the tutorial here, we're going to skip over these ships, uh, which are sort of different. We're going to uh, skip over the anti-sub stuff that will be going on around Sydney and elsewhere, because we're going to make a whole episode out of anti-sub warfare, which is so important to the uh, allied player early on. Um, we're going to skip over mine, the mine laying, the mine detection, so local mine sweepers uh, is a grouping, uh, a task force grouping that you can make. We will have those at Sydney. If we pull up the ships at port, let's go to the type. What do we have here? We have a destroyer, Voyager, which is all kind of by itself. The reason is, I can tell you as we move over here, it has a little bit of damage. And we'll get into damage when we talk about individual ships, but it has, you know, 10 system damage. So it's come here to Sydney to get repaired. And repair is its own deal. It's not that complicated once you understand it, uh, but we're just not going to do that in this episode. So we have Voyager here. Uh, as you go down these ships, it will tell you what these ships are. So I've sorted them by type. Uh, Westralia is a cruised, uh, cruiser armed merchant. Um, this generally is something you will send with a task force because it's like a cruiser. It's got, you know, some anti-aircraft. It uh, has these guns. It's got nice, you know, six inch guns here. It can protect a task force from surface ships it might not be that great you know look back here anti-sub it's got none so it doesn't really help us with the subs but it gives us a little anti-aircraft and it's got some guns uh so you know sending that along with a uh, task force can be beneficial it's also got a little cargo capacity here so that's great a cm is a cruiser mine layer as i said we'll get into mine laying um, in a future episode, maybe the next one will deal with um, mine laying, uh, local mine sweeping, general mine sweeping. We'll get into mines and, and how they work. The AMs, as I just said, mine sweepers. So CM, you know, you can tell by the M, say, hey, mine. Okay. Uh, CM is a mine layer. AM is a mine sweeper. So you have these because the Japanese could be coming to Sydney and laying mines. They can do that with submarines. I can tell you down here at early in the war, it's not going to be a huge deal, but up by uh, Palembang or some of, you know, up near Borneo, definitely Singapore. Uh, for instance, they definitely mine the port at Singapore. So these mine sweepers will detect those and blow them up in their, you know, anti-mine sweeping netting. And uh, so we will be setting up task forces for those. An AI, or <laughs> AI, an AO is an auxiliary oiler. It's a replenishment ship. This kind of ship will, later in the game, we'll use it as a support ship for a carrier or a battleship task force 
to refuel everything. These things have huge capacity for fuel. Early in the game, you're starving for tankers, so we're going to use it just like a tanker. And here are all your tankers. So we have these tankers. We're going to go to Cole's spreadsheet, and we're going to figure out what Cole says is the best way to use these tankers. So let's do that. I'm going to look over at the spreadsheet. You can't see it. Uh, you could pull it, on, pull it up if you wanted to and put it over to the side. But we're going to start with the TK Elsa, so the Tanker Elsa. Um, and we are going to form a task force. So let's do that. We're going to form a Tanker Task Force. Now you'll see this has a lot more options than what we had seen last episode when we pulled this up. That's because there are more of a variety of ships here. So there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of different missions that you can run with these ships if you wanted to. Um, but we're going to go through that. So tanker, that's, you know, we got a T TK ship. We want to build a tanker task force. We are going to turn automatic ship selection off. We're not going to worry about any of this stuff. We're going to set it on the main task force screen. So we're going to do tanker. Awesome. Uh, let's get these set up right. There we go. We know the Elsa. Now I can just tell you, Elsa, its endurance is 8,800. It would barely make it to LA and barely make it back. You'd be refueling on both ends of that journey. Uh, so it's very likely, and at a speed of 12 as, composed, as compared to these other tankers, it's very likely that Cull is going to not have us go all the way to LA with this tanker. It also has a little, uh, a slight less bit of uh, capacity, you see here. Just looking down here, uh, William Sunico is very similar. As a matter of fact, they look like exactly the same kind of ship. So we'll see what we do with the Sunico, but we're going to pick the Elsa for this task force. For now, the way I build these generally is I, I pull the one down and build and start the task force. Uh, so hit done. Here it is. We've got our tanker task force. Uh, it has no orders, no name, blah, blah, blah. We, it has nothing, but it has the Elsa in here, which is at this moment, the flagship. And so we are going to figure out where Cole thinks the best place to send this is, having looked over this game and knowing this game as well as he does. Um, you know what? I'm going to look at the William Sunico because now I'm just, yep, sure enough. So there is a second tanker in this task force. Um, so if you ever have a situation, uh, go back, go back. We have the tanker Elsa. It could, this is fine. It can, one ship can make its own task force. But if you ever have a situation where you want to add more ships to it, transfer ships to and from task force. We'll click on that. We will, you know, set these up again by by uh, sorting them, and we'll go to the William Sunico. As I said, it makes a lot of sense to me. These would be in the exact same task force. They have all the exact same stats, uh, and you usually want to keep those ships together on a similar mission. Looking up here at the other tankers, they're all faster than the tankers we have here. Um, and so we really wouldn't want these to be in with the other ones. So we've got this. Now, uh, looking at the orders that is, are suggested, we find that we want to dock this task force, of course. So it's 10,600 tons. We're going to dock it. Now we're docked. We're going to load fuel which makes sense. Um, that's what the tankers are for, is either loading fuel or loading oil. As I've said previously, let's not even worry about oil. I think maybe there's oil here. Hey, let's go look. Why not? I, can't, I can never resist such temptation. Yep, there's 460 oil here, but that's going to be pumped into the industry here at Sydney. So we're not going to be transporting it anywhere. We're transporting fuel. So as you'll see down here, we have a new task force. You're like, 
Uh, okay, so that's the symbol or emblem for tanker. It looks kind of like a tanker, or it should. It's also an olive green. Why is that? So we've got all these bright green things out here. Let's click on it and find out why. The reason is, is this is a US Navy task force. So the Australian task force, task forces and all of the Australian units are this kind of a darker forest green, I would call it. And uh, the US, every US unit is an olive green. So you do have some distinction on the allied side, you can tell. That also helps when you're thinking about command, who's in, you know, it's more helpful with ground troops to think about command, but in this case, you know, it's interesting to see this. So this is a US task force. Both of these ships, the Sunoco is a US Navy ship. Uh, we know that it's a commission ship because it doesn't have an X in front of it. Uh, the Elsa, is a Commonwealth. Hey, okay. So this goes to show you something different. I had just assumed they were both U.S. ships. They're not. One is a U.S. ship, one's a Commonwealth ship. There is also a distinction between British and Commonwealth. I say a distinction. It doesn't really make a whole heck of a lot of difference. Neither does this, the fact that it's an American and a Commonwealth ship. But this color will take always take on the color of the flagship. So the flagship here, why they picked the Sunoco, maybe it has a better uh, commander. I, I don't know. We're not going to go into that. The point being is the flagship will make this a U.S. task force. You know, it could be a Commonwealth task force. It wouldn't matter. So what are we going to do with this? So we've docked it. We're loading fuel. This is going to Nomaya. So Nomaya is right here. I said the endurance for this task force was only 8,800. So it's not going to be making huge transatlantic journeys. We're going to be using this to supply something close. Nomaya is a very important point on the map for the allies. Why is that? It's one of these daisy chain islands. So we might as well just do this now because they're very important. Nomaya. Suva and Nadi, they're kind of, you know, sister cities, but Suva, Pago Pago, Christmas, Palmyra, Pearl Harbor. That's, that's your crescent down here through the Pacific, especially early game, where we're going to build our defensive perimeter to keep the Japanese out. Uh, Canton... If you have a very passive Japanese player, you can sometimes hold on to Canton and reinforce it. Uh, we will not do that in this game. We're going to build this crescent, as I call it, uh, Palmyra, Christmas, down here to Pago. And these are all fairly decent sized places. Now, this is only a two. We'll build it into a five. Suva is actually a decent size already. It's, well, it's, I guess not. It's a three, but it does have a size two airfield building to a seven. So that's great. Uh, Nadi can go to a seven airfield. So that's good. Nomaya can go to a four port. It's already a two. Uh, and a five air, airfield, and it's already a two. We also will try to hold on to Luganville, which is a three five, because if the Japanese get a hold of this, they can start messing with our supply lines because we're going to be bringing a ton of supply ships from here at Sydney straight across, uh, maybe avoid this to here or so, and then bring them up here behind Christmas Island, behind Palmyra, behind Pearl Harbor, up to the west coast so and down the same way these things will be running constant convoys so we're going to try to build that defensive crescent uh as the allied player so because of that we've got to get planes out here eventually um we're going to have troops that we're going to be bringing in now you can see it there's already a ship at anchor and there's uh some ground unit out here uh, it's just one. You can see it. The Na New Caledonia Detachment Infantry. 
Also, I'll point out, this is a French flag. The French are, this is one of the old French colonies, uh, New Caledonia. So we do have some French units in the game. I can tell you this will be Australian and American uh, pretty, pretty fast. One other thing I'll point out is if the Japanese do start to push, uh, push us on our crescent, Tahiti is right down here, which is another French base. There are a lot of French islands out here. Bora Bora will take a little nice vacation. No, Tahiti would be our fallback line and some really important tankers. I will run down below Tahiti because you just can't afford to lose them, especially early in the game. But let's get over here, back over to Sydney. I should use the mini map more. I don't mean to make you... Um, I don't mean to make you like a little dizzy scrolling around this map, but as you can see, as we add uh, task forces, it will show us a couple of ships here. It's not going to show all the task forces. I think two is the max, like, it's, you know, you've got multiple task forces here or whatever. So our orders here, and we're going to change this to tanker. No Maya, no Maya, however you want to say it. As I talked about last time with the naming conventions, I want to know all the time what's its mission and where uh, does it go all the time. I can figure out where the home port is, where it returns. That's easy right there. I want to know all the time what's the main mission of this, this tanker task force. Tanker, no Maya. So we're going to name it that. And no matter how many task forces we have that are going to Nomaya that are tankers, we'll call every one of them Tanker Nomaya. That way I can pull up this card and say, oh, this is that tanker that always goes back and forth to Nomaya. Great. Um, what other orders do we want to give it? So we look down here. We've docked it. We know we're loading fuel. That's great. What do we want it to do when it gets to Nomaya? Like, what's what's the end goal here? Um, retirement allowed is fine. If it gets out there, we don't want it to hang around Nomaya. We want it to go there. We want it to unload its cargo and return. So retirement allowed is perfect. Uh, mission speed. We're always got no reason to have this at full speed. You know, if we turned it to this, it starts burning a ton more fuel. You see, that even turns red. Well, what's the point of running fuel to Nomaya if we have to uh, refuel out there? Uh, we don't want it to disband. We want it to keep going back and forth and staying active. Full refuel. We do not want it to refuel at Nomaya. So we're going to change that to do not refuel. And if you look up here, this is why. With this endurance, this task force can go 220 hexes. It takes 28 to go to Nomaya. It takes 57 for the round trip, meaning it's really 28 and a half out to Nomaya, 28 and a half back, which makes it 57. So 28, that's good. 57 is good. We won't refuel this again until it gets back to Sydney. So there we go. We've got a tanker task force to Nomaya. So let's get out of there. We've built a task force. Let's build another task force. Uh, and we're going to do this with our other, uh, some of our other tankers. But this is going to be more of a long journey. So we're going to look for the Falkofel and the Erling Brovig. Down here, we're going to go type. Uh, you know, we can always do this, right? And just bring up nothing but the tankers. So Erling Brovig. Nice looking ship. Uh, we're going to form a new task force. It's going to be a tanker task force. This will bring up all of these again, take off all ships, just bring up the tankers. Now you'll see, here's another thing. There's always something else in this game. The William Sunico and the Elsa were the two tankers we just put in that task force. You see over here, it says TF-18. If you don't want to misclick them and make sure you don't, you know, get them off their orders, click on this in task forces. It will take off the ones that are in task forces. 
when it just says location in a town, it means they're not in a task force. It will show you TF, whatever the number is, if it's in a task force. So we have these here at Sydney. Now we can see the Erling Brovig goes at a speed 16. Hey, that's great. It's got pretty good uh, endurance. So we're going to click on that and the Falkenfell. Now I told you usually we would like these to be pretty much the same. Um, I'm going to look up the Searstad. What are we going to do with the Searstad? Because that has some pretty decent uh, endurance. And yep, sure enough, it's recommend that, recommended that we put the Searstad in here as well. So the Searstad and the Falkofell are very, you know, very similar. They're only off by 500 endurance. The speed is very similar. Uh, you know, Falkofell has a little more fuel capacity. That's fine, whatever. Uh, it's interesting, the Brovig is faster. I think just for convenience sake, we're gonna put these three together because when we click done here, awesome. We've got our three tankers, they're ready to go. Um, and what are we gonna do with this task force? What are our orders? What do, you know, what do we want this to do eventually? So, these have really nice endurances. It's over 10,000. I told you 12,000, but really, you know, anything over 10,000 is a pretty good endurance. Um, we are not going to load this up with anything. What we're going to do is we're going to call this Tanker Sydney. So that should give you a clue that, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's, what's going on here? Sydney. Sounds like a great place. We're going to call this Tanker Sydney. We are going to tell this task force to go over here to the mini map, go to LA. So with these endurances and with these speeds, we want these suckers running from LA to Sydney dropping off stuff. Once it gets to Sydney, we'll use the ones with lower endurance and lower speed to then supply these islands. But for the ones with, you know, a decent speed, so anything, you know, over 12 basically is pretty good speed for especially a cargo or a tanker ship. Um, and with bigger endurances, we want them going there. We're also going to set the home port to LA. So the home port is going to be LA as well. Um, and that turned this green, you'll notice, right? Because it's not making the round trip from LA to Sydney, we have set the destination as LA and it's gonna stay at LA. It's not doing anything else until we give it new orders, which we will. So when that pulls into port at LA, we're gonna dock it, we're gonna fill these suckers up with fuel, as this is a lot of fuel. We're gonna fill them up and then we're gonna send them back to Sydney and that's the route it's gonna take. Its home port's gonna be LA, its destination's gonna be Sydney, It'll go unload at Sydney and come back. It just happened to start over here. Uh, this is a Commonwealth task force. It just happened to start in Sydney, but we want to start these convoys going from the U.S. West Coast to Sydney. So, you know, like I said, big capacity, good speed, really good speed for tankers, um, and above a 10,000 endurance. That's great for going U.S. West Coast to Australia. We're going to make sure we understand when it pulls into LA, hey, what's this? the ultimate mission for this thing? Because we'll forget. And then we'll look at LA when we pull up a turn and we'll say, oh, yeah, we got, the, we got those three tankers coming in. And now we're going to start sending them over to Sydney. Now, one thing I will point out, we're going to be giving this another order. And this is great because this really gives us a chance to talk about um, kind of a, a different concept that we haven't talked about yet. Give me one second. I'm sorry, I'm flipping over to this database um, because I thought so. And yes, we are going to be adding another ship to this tanker group. So we don't want to disband. So if you ever just want to, you know, you put something together, it's not correct. I almost hit on this on accident. You can disband a task force uh, by hitting this button. So, you know, if you ever look down here, disband, dock, 
uh, fuel it up, uh, fuel it up when it merges somewhere, you know, out at sea with something, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but you can disband these immediately. They'll just break up and everything will go back to at anchor. You can do that here. But there is another ship that we're going to be putting into this task force, and it is the A.O. Bishopdale. So we're going to put this in here, and we're going to look at this. Uh, great. So the Bishopdale is an AO. It's not a tanker. So it might not have been obvious to us at first that it would go into this task force. But the Bishopdale has 12, 500 endurance, 14 speed, and a, a big capacity. I mean, anything over like four or four or 5,000 is a real nice capacity. So we've got this big, uh, big ship. What the heck is this thing? This is an oiler, or what they call an oiler. Um, it is a replenishment ship later in the game. And what do I mean by replenishment? It will be in its own little task force trailing behind the carriers or a big battleship group ready to fill it up. These are like floating uh, fuel stations. They're floating gas stations. Um, these AOs. So they're, you know, O is for oiler. I have no idea what the A is about, but I always see that O and I'm like, oh, it's an oiler. That's great. They're floating gas stations. That's what they are. Later in the game, when we put together huge, massive task forces that are going to go attack Japanese islands, these will hang back and be ready to refuel. Early in the game, we're going to use them as tankers because we have a huge deficit of tankers. And there's no reason we can't fill this sucker up, take it from L.A. and bring it to Sydney with a bunch of fuel in it. So um, that's great. We're going to put that. I, I thought that there was something else that we put in this task force. And sure enough, there was. Now, this gives us a chance, though, to talk about a different concept. So we're going to leave this for a second. You see this brown here? That's Commonwealth, that color of brown. So this is a, a Commonwealth you know, tanker group. It looks just the same, same picture. Not that that's a huge deal. Just wanted to point that out. Now look at the, at the path that the computer has drawn for this task force. And I wish I could zoom out a little bit because you can really see how ridiculous it is. Look how close we are getting to Japanese islands here. I mean, the ja I don't think this is a big enough airfield to run big bombers out of here, but this is just, uh, you know, like something out of a funny movie where you're floating around in the Pacific and you're like, hello, hello, Japanese uh, submarine, hello, Japanese ship, because this would just get, you know, decimated out here floating by itself. So what do we do about that? Because we want it to go to L.A., um, but we sure as heck don't want it to just float through the middle of the Pacific uh, and up in here when we've got a full Japanese task force coming this way. So what do we do? Let's click on this again. You can set up waypoints. All right, there's, there's four different things you can set up here. I think we've already talked about routing control, normal, safest, safer. This is kind of just a general direction to the AI about how you want uh, this thing to move. Most of the time you're gonna be on normal. Sometimes you'll be on direct. You could, I'll show you some places. We'll do coastal into Palembang, but that's a whole different thing. Threat tolerance, you know, normal, low, high, they, that all makes sense, right? Absolute, which is you just don't give a heck. You are going to go where you're going to go. It doesn't matter. Um, patrol zone. Oh, I can't wait to get to that. We're going to do that with subs and anti-subs, but use waypoints. So let's go back to make sure you, you know, saw where this is all going to go. We've named it. I love it. This is a nice big, think about all these fuel points that are going to be coming to Australia. That's great. We got everything the way we want it, but we're floating through the middle of the Pacific based on what the computer wants us to do. We're going to use waypoints. And how does this work? It's actually very simple. It's a great system, I think. Set waypoint one. Now let's go back 
you can always click on the mini map and it doesn't set anything. So use the mini map to be how you move around. So we're at Sydney. Hey, this is cool. This shows you, you know, this tanker task force, every pulse. I, it looks like I can go one, two, three, you know, a little more than four um, hexes per pulse. And the max speed isn't much more than that. So we'll be on cruise speed. Now for these, you want to be going straight behind this picket fence. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Hoosiers, you'll get the reference. You want to go be going behind this picket fence. So you're going to be wanting to take this straight through here behind Suva, Nadi, Nomaya, uh, Pago. This is all what we talked about before. You want it to go back here. Now, I'm not going to follow exactly where Cole says that you should set this waypoint, um, just because I'm not going to try to find the exact hex. You basically want this thing to go below that picket fence. So we've set waypoint one. Let's hit set waypoint two. Um, and see, in green, this will show you what you have set as waypoint one. And then the minute you have waypoint one set, it's going to start trying to go to, straight to LA. So we might want to set a second one, depending how far into the war we are. Now see, this is fine. We've set our one waypoint. It's going to go behind our crescent, our picket fence, behind Christmas, behind Palmyra, behind Pearl Harbor, you know, which is right there. Um, it's going to go behind here and route straight to LA. Woohoo, there we go. Wow. Pacific's a big ocean, my friends. Um, and it's going to go straight to LA. So that's how waypoints work. Now, later in the war, I said use the minimap, and then I immediately don't use the minimap. So here's waypoint one. Later in the war, we might say, uh, we, we might bring things down here on the this is like a secondary route for me generally where we bring it below the cook islands and then we set our our waypoint right below tahiti and then we have some ships out here to defend it tahiti uh you may you know at some point also say hey i know i've driven the japanese way back and set your second waypoint here behind christmas island to kind of cut the distance a little bit as it is i'm going to hit the right mouse button right now if i clicked on it i'll just do it for the hell of it um and there we go you can see what we've set up here we've got you know uh i set the second waypoint if you ever want to get rid of that click on this go back here you can uh, clear all waypoints or you can say set waypoint two. you can put it somewhere else uh, I, I love this system for setting plot points I'm just gonna leave that as it is it doesn't matter you'll see here it says refuel options um, generally on something like this you're not gonna be refueling at sea uh, you can't if you send out an oiler to meet this because it was a more important you know as a carrier task force or something you could uh, set this up to hit minimal refuel, full refuel. It's beyond the scope here. The one thing that is not beyond the scope to, is return the same route. Um, you, why is that not working? Hold on, let's drag this back up. Set waypoints, return to, it's not gonna let us do that. Hold, oh, I know why, sorry. It's because we've set the home port at LA and the destination at LA. If Let's just do this uh, for for academic sake. If we still had our home port at Sydney, it's going to be going down these waypoints, you know, to LA. And then the minute it's completed its mission, it's going to want to come back to Sydney. We're going to want to set return same route. Uh, we would turn this to yes. Why is that? Uh, if you don't, that that kind of crappy um, routing that it was taking before, it's always going to try to find the most efficient route uh, that the algorithm tells it to do under normal. So if it's taking that route, it's going to try to come back that way. So you've set the waypoints one way. This makes it go come back the same way. 
And with that, hold on, mission speed 295. Oh, this will be uh, something interesting to bring up next time. I think this has run long enough. I really don't want these to run over an hour. Uh, you know, as you've seen, you can run down a million rabbit holes when it comes to uh, what we're doing here. So <laughs> sometimes they run a little longer than I want them to. When we come back, we're going to set uh, in the next episode, I'm, I may call it just Task Force 2. We will set up more task forces. We've only gotten into the tankers here at Sydney. We'll also be doing the cargo task forces because from Sydney, you will be getting supply in from the US. That supply, you will then be kicking out to Nomaya, uh, Luganville, Suva, Naughty. Um, we haven't even talked about, you know, here's New Zealand down here. We've got a whole island down here, uh, Auckland. So we'll talk about that next time uh, and make that Task Force 2. And then I think the episode after that will get into some anti-submarine warfare and what you do with your submarines. And that'll take us most of the way through ships. We talked about uh, aircraft carriers this time. That's cool. We'll, you know, eventually talk about how we get uh, planes launching off our aircraft carriers, which is, you know, obviously with any game with the Pacific War, the carriers are the most fun uh, parts of the game. They're really cool. So I hopefully you enjoyed this episode. I'm trying to take you through very very slowly at the end of this i think i will be making kind of a grand tie it together one hour episode of here are the high points this is what you really need to know you know play this game learn to play this game in 60 minutes but right now i really want people to learn um so if there's a, a section that you don't really understand very well i'm trying to cover all the major points uh, because i really want people to enjoy this game so as always, thank you for joining me. If you enjoyed this, um, you know, hit subscribe at the bottom. I always appreciate that. Uh, love to make these videos. We're going to be making them for a lot of different strategy games. So if you like this one, hit subscribe. And uh, this has been Strategy Gaming jo Dojo. Thanks and see you next time.